Welcome to another Sharing Your Passion. I am delighted to have with me today Lizette Schutemacher. Now, I must say straight away that I'm not pronouncing her name very well. She's from Amsterdam, she's Dutch, she has a name which, to me at least, is slightly unusual and difficult to pronounce. So, Lizette, how do you pronounce your surname? Lizette Schutemacher. There you are. Try repeating that at home. Okay. <laughs> Lizette is with me. She is the Chair of Trustees at the Findhorn Foundation in Scotland. And um, the Findhorn Foundation, as many of you will know, is a spiritual community here in Scotland um, with a great reputation for all things spiritual, um, known around the world. And I think it's fair to say that Lizette has a very privileged position in being the chair of trustees, which is like the overview of the whole thing, the overlighting angel maybe, or, or slightly less than that, as one might say at <laughs> Findhorn. But you are the angel of the trustees, Lizette. Um, Am I? <laughs> you look very angelic to me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for joining me. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you and to have you on the show. Um, tell me, Sir Lizette, you know, we, the world seems to be in such a transition at the moment. Um, where, what do you see as the, the light at the, the end of the tunnel, if there is a tunnel? So just to start with an, with an easy, a small just to start and easy with question, an easy right? question to a warm small you and up. Easy yeah. question to warm me up. Um, well, I'm not going to do like big. I'm Dutch, so sometimes I don't know the word. Then the word doesn't come. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, express myself on the state of the world. But I, what I see myself, or my latest theory, I'll share my latest theory with you. My latest theory is that. Uh, we are waves of potentiality, right? Mm -hmm. So that was, like, it's like physics from a hundred years ago that discovered that. We're waves of potentiality. We're waves of potentiality. Right. Everything is a wave of potentiality until you focus on it, then it becomes a particle. Right. But a particle thinks it is a particle. A particle tends to forget about a wave of potentiality. And so when, as a human, we are in our particle consciousness, we kind of rub against each other as particles mm. and we become very particular because I want things my particle way and I want to push you around to my particle way. And I see a lot of that happening in the world where particles bump into one another with their worldviews, with the way they want things to be with, you know, this is, this is certainly how it is and mm. you're completely wrong. And so light at the end of the tunnel for me is that we remember that we are waves of potentiality that turn into particles when we focus on it. But that remembering, which is kind of a, an anti-gravity movement, mm. you know, to not give in to the, the gravity of, of the busyness of everyday life, where, where things are material and difficult and you have to kind of push your, your email through the inbox of somebody else. Yes. Uh, but remember that we are waves of potentiality because in this consciousness of being the wave of potentiality you can flow much more easily and kind of see mm. what is it that wants to happen and how can I add my attention to what is happening and work with the other waves until you know you have to materialize at some point yeah but that happens anyway but not to identify with this so somewhere find a way between being a particle, not forgetting, we're waves of potentiality. Mm. But also, you know, in a spiritual community, of course, we are sometimes, people think we're always in a wave of, of potentiality and not, nothing ever comes on the ground, right? So not, right. not hang out here all the time. Yeah. But be both. And, and in, in the tension, in the creative tension of both, that's where life, you know, moment to moment mm. can arise. Mm. It's an interesting analogy as well because I, I remember reading recently about this transition from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius and Pisces being connected with, let's say, rigidity or more rigidity and the Aquarian age being flexibility and flow. So that seems to fit very much. 
with the transition that, that we're going through. Um, many people watching um, Lizette may not know very much about Findhorn itself. So can you give us a little bit of a, um, yeah. a Findhorn lesson, or certainly it would help me as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we can put into context your role as trustee. Yeah. Uh, so maybe first to say Findhorn is a little village near Inverness uh, in the north of Scotland. That's already useful to know. Where three people, uh, um, the Caddies, uh, a couple, and their friend Dorothy McLean came in 1962. Wow. So, yeah, 1962. Moment. They came because life led them here. You could say it was the, the will of God. Uh, you would say life circumstances forced them here. Anyway, they started a, a garden here and, and people started to come here because what they were doing was, was we still honor those three founding principles that, that they carried. Like Eileen would, would sit and be still and meditate, which we still do here every morning, uh, meditate and, and listen to, to the, the still small voice within. And, and she got guidance because when you are really silent and you listen below or beyond or the voices that have their, their chatter, chattering in your mind, then you kind of come closer to the truth of what is wanted through you. And Dorothy at some point came into contact with the beings, the, the subtle beings that live on this earth with us. Because there is so much that we can't see. We have only a very limited scope of vision. Yes. So, you know, when people say, but Lizette, you can't see those beings, I say, well, what, what have you just, what's this, this here that we can't see? You know, when we can't breathe this anymore, that's the end of our life. There's so many things we can't see anyway. And then the third principle is that work is love and action. So that whatever you do, you give your heart to, whatever it is really, and, and then that work gives back to you. So we, we reflect a lot here actually. Before we, before we do something, we kind of go like, how, how is my inner feeling? Or what, what's really changed my life from when I first came here in 98 is, is that before doing anything, you sit together, you have a moment of silence, you have a check-in in which you say, you know, one person will say, I feel great, I can do, you know, move the fridge from here to there, that's fine with me, and the other person will say, I feel a bit tender, I would like to just, you know, polish this today, and then somehow the work that's needed to be done fits with where the people are, right. and, and so the work serves you as you serve, serve the work. And, and so Fintorn has grown from, from these three people and their friends and, and David Spangler and Rock and other amazing people who came here to a Fintorn foundation, which you could say is at the heart now of the, of the eco-village and spiritual community that the Fintorn community is. Yeah. Now, the Fintorn Foundation is a charity and therefore a charity requires trustees. You are the chair of trustees. Tell us a little bit about how you came to be that, or how you came to be a trustee, and, and what actually that means. What, what, what do you do as a trustee? Yeah, so when I first came here in 98, I, um, it's, you know, it still touches me. Oh. That I came here and I walked around and I saw this is, this is the outer manifestation of my inner life. That okay. is what this is how, what a world looks like in here. And now I see it created here. So I wanted to come and live here. But I had recently met the man of my life who is an abstract modern painter and who would love to live in Berlin or, or in New York. And so, you know, he wasn't gonna move here and I didn't really wanna go there. So we live in Amsterdam very happily. Um, but I thought I can do things for this community. I can do a bit of fundraising. I can do a bit of publicity. And I thought, you know, when you've when you've come somewhere and, and fallen in love, that's what you do. Uh, but apparently, not everybody does that. And so I made some friends here easily. Yeah, because I did these things. And at some point, they asked me to um, to do a bit more and do a bit more. And and so. 
Then they asked me to become a trustee and I became in 2002 and I was very intimidated actually to sit on that board with really, very to begin with. wise other people who had yeah. been here for 30 years ah, and yeah. you know knew all about the history, had, had known Peter and Eileen intimately when they were young. Um, so yeah, I really had to learn to, uh, to trust myself as a trustee. Um, and two years ago when the chair, the then chair, was announcing that he was leaving and he was kind of nudging me, he said, you're the next chair. I said, but we did an attunement, which is also something that I have learned here in Fintor. And Can you just explain a little bit to people yeah. who may not know, sorry, let's say, no, a little I bit about, because I, yeah. Yeah. So that what achievement means. Yeah, so an achievement, the way we do this in this board is when we are thinking of, uh, of new people to, to come in, um, we, we go in silence, we go in meditation, and we invoke a column of light. And then we name the name of that person, and we just notice, we notice what we see, and and we get information, and when we come out, we share that information, and it gives us actually a very clear picture on, on timing and, and what to do. And, um, and so we did an attunement about who was gonna be the next chair. And, and I was sat next to somebody uh, on a sofa, we shared this sofa, and so we did this attunement, we had a column of light, and the question was, you know, is, is there any yeah, can, you, can you give us some clarity on the next chairperson? Right. And I just felt, you know, something come to me and kind of fall onto me, like the mantle fall onto me. And the woman who was sat next to me said, you know, she also had that sense. And it was very clear to me that, uh, that it was me. I didn't really have a say in the matter, actually. Wow. It's like on my path. Yeah. So, yeah. And I believe in these things, that there are things that are on our path and we can either do them or not do them, but it's better to do them. Mm. What <laughs> is on your path now, um, either as a trustee or in terms of your, your personal life? What is exercising, exercising your mind now mostly? Yes, yeah, so as a trustee and uh, as a, as a chair, as a trustee, we are, we are in, in the end responsible. Mm. So if everything would go wrong here, then the tax man would come and find us. But we've delegated to management as boards do and, and we're blessed with excellent people who, who, who run this place really, really well. So, so as a trustee, um, You know, what, what we do, you can describe on many levels, but maybe the most um, intimate and true level is, is that the purpose of this place um, asks of us to guard it. Mm. Mm. And so I think management is also in service of mm. the purpose of this place. Mm. But they're in it, they're in it, in the day to day with everything that is happening and with the budget and with you know, guests coming and not coming and conferences mm. happening and all these things. And, and so as a board, twice a year we come and, and the pace is a bit different. And we can ask uh, questions and and they prepare for our meetings, which is also like, okay, so, so for the next half year we do this until trustees, and then we do that until trustees, not because trustees are so important, but because it is a, a moment in time, actually. Mm. And um, I have all kinds of voices, very much also my father's voice in me, that says to me, you need to know, you're the chair, you need to know where this charity is going. And so, my counter voice is, um, I don't think so. Mm. I think the purpose knows, and I think that when we sit together with all that we know, and also admitting to all that we don't know, we, we are being given uh, glimpses of next steps. Mm. 
So even when shaping the agenda, I used to kind of craft the agenda uh, when I was uh, the deputy chair. Uh, but now I do this differently. There's much more kind of open space in the agenda. And like one day we will get all kinds of briefings and then the next day, I, I cannot say, I don't know what the subject is that we're going to speak about. Mm. And I don't want to pre-program it. Oh, yeah. I just want space to be open so we can decide mm. at the end of Saturday what it is that still needs more attention on Sunday. Mm. And, and to me that is edgy because it it feels like, you know, there's a side of me that says, you ought to know. You're the chair, aren't yes. you? You ought to know. <laughs> and so I need to hold out right. against that and kind of have, um, have emergence happen. Mm -hmm. Have, you know, collective intelligence start to speak through us mm -hmm. instead of going through a set agenda. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, so that's occupying my mind. So how much how much then connection do you have with the sort of the day-to-day -day, um, activities in, in, in Finhorn? Is it simply the, you know, you're doing the, um, performing the legal requirements obviously as a trustee, but how much of an overview do you have of what's actually going on in the community? I understand you have quite a bit, don't you? Yes, you know there's there's much reporting going on. Mm. There's monthly figures of how many people come, uh, and and yeah. are participants in the in the programs. There is there's cash flashes. There is uh, you know every month we are we're updated on things, and I, I speak with the chair of of the management of course every month, and mm. I I have been coming over a lot. Mm. Um, I'm here now about once a week a month which is, which is a lot but I do not have anything to do with the day-to-day -day running right okay it's really yeah. that it really is to the people here mm -hmm. and also I feel as trustees we, we shouldn't meddle in that at all right yeah you know, just mm -hmm. say what are strategic directions can we set some direction or affirm mm -hmm. better better it is even to affirm mm -hmm. the directions that come mm -hmm. out of you know, out of the body of co-workers and, and management. Mm. Can I ask you, um, if we look back to the 60s, um, that was a time when I think many people would say, yes, this is a time that is rife for spiritual community. That was a time when this was very much in the energy of the world. Um, and now, um, uh, 50 plus years later, what would you say is the, the, the raison d'etre of a spiritual community, and in particular Finhorn? Wow, that's a, um, I think the thirst for a connected life right. is bigger than ever. Mm. Um, because so many have tried um, have tried the way of materialism you know, yeah. left the church, left their communities mm. and, and found and made a good life for themselves or, and then at some point go like is this all there is? and, and I think also the feedback from from the world, from uh, you know the plastic, the plastic islands mm. in the oceans, the overfishing, um, the the deforestation, the ice caps melting, um, and that is all feedback from a particular way of living, and here Fintorn is also. A spiritual community. It is also uh, a birther. It was like one of the first eco villages, and an eco village sounds a bit quaint, uh, but an eco village a city could be an eco village in the in the way that mm. you know everything is connected. You source locally. You you deal with one another. You don't get everything from all over the world, but you you're really mindful of of how you can live lightly on the earth and. 
not only that, really live as part of the fabric of life. And I think it is more necessary than ever. Mm. Do you see living in community as the way in, in the future? I mean, community in the sort of Findhorn type sense, i.e. smaller community um, in terms of the numbers of people not living in towns or cities? Um. Well, the strange thing is, I'm really a city person. Ah. I'm, I love living in Amsterdam. Now, Amsterdam is, of course, like a world famous city that is actually kind of a village. Right. It's quite small. Uh, but I love city life. I love the culture. I love the buzz. I love the creativity. I even love the tourists that we have many of in Amsterdam now. That's a bit of a, a thing in Amsterdam these Thanks days. So. Um, and I don't... I think wherever you live, everybody has community. Mm. And... And we also have these Facebook communities, all these friends all over the world now. Right. So I don't know if living in community like it is here is the answer, but I do think that the inclusivity that is here, mm. that the community here is, when you're in Fintor and when you're in this community, you know, when you, when you go and have dinner, you just sit next to a person and you and you you come from a place that you're interested in that person so the inclusivity the taking all of life and and everyone inclusive i think that is the answer mm -hmm. and is it about living in harmony and and you know fulfilling one's potential um i mean one could say that i guess of the whole world but isn't that part of the focus or the intended focus of a spiritual community to actually allow people to express their uniqueness as well? Or is it more a, a compact thing? I, I, yeah, I think it's, it's back to the waves of potentiality right. and the particles, right? Because it is, yes, express, express, express your uniqueness and, and what I love about this place is also the arts. You know, can you play music? We will listen to you, even though you know you're not a concert pianist. Right. But we know that you love this, so we love it with you. Uh, and those kinds of things. I think right. that's a spiritual attitude. Not find fault, mm. but but really be with one another in in your learning and growing and evolution mm. to whatever you want to be. Mm. We'll come back to Fintor. Let's talk about Lisette. Mm. Um, what would you say were your, if you like, um, were your greatest influences in your life that have brought you here? Mm, my greatest influences in my life. Um, now, what comes to mind immediately is um, I'm an eldest daughter. I'm the eldest of four. I've written a book called Het oudste dochter effect, that's Dutch again. The eldest but daughter effect. The, yeah. the yeah. eldest yeah. daughter effect is going yeah. to be published uh, right. uh, soon. Um, and I think that being an eldest and having to kind of make sense of what happened when my brother was born and how my position was ha has been a huge influence on, on me. Um, I think also being the child of parents who, especially after World War II, but even before that, were kind of, they were modern people. Mm. My parents uh, were after the war people. They helped build up society again. And, and so they helped create affluence and abundance, material abundance, so, so that you know, the poverty and, and the ignorance that, that burst the whole Nazism wouldn't happen again. Mm. Uh, but I found that also a bit empty. So, so you know, there was an, an emptiness that that I have sought to uh, to fill, and and for me, that came with um, with discovering spirituality. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I used for a long time have like a, a public life in which I was a successful 
businesswoman, and then I used to have a private life in which I would read, you know, Shirley MacLaine's books. Uh, when was this? In the 80s, I think she wrote. I was mm. like, wow, here's this famous woman who publicly declares, you know, that she is first and foremost a spiritual person. And, and so, yeah, yeah. I would want to thank her, actually. Maybe I'm going to send her an email and say, you know, she must know that she's done this for, for many people. Yeah. And, and, and so at some point, I also found, you know, the friends who, who were not kind of of the mainstream that, that I mostly was in at the time. And, and I changed my life completely. And I went to the Barbara Brennan School. I got myself a, a Bachelor of Science in Brennan Healing Science. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, I, I'm not a faithful um, uh, disciple. I have never been able to, to decide on, on one teacher or one teaching. And maybe that's also why Fintorn suits me so well. Mm. Because here all teachings and you know, all paths to the one, to what it is essentially the same one thing yeah. um, that we're all made of and that we're all looking for and that we all are already are welcome. Mm. Was there ever a sense of, um, you know, am I on the right path? Is this really for me? Is this really who I am? Did you ever have any sort of, um, for want of a better expression, identity crisis? And I don't want to suggest that you did, but was, you know, has there been that, that sort of element as well as part of your journey? Well, I think I have had that for a long time. I mean, I could function well in, in, in the business world as long as I was there and I had a lot of fun and it was creative, but also it never really suited me mm. because there was, I'd become a vegetarian at age 16, which wasn't normal in that world. Um, uh, when all my, my friends were starting to find partners and getting married and settling down and buying home houses and having children, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> so, so I never completely settled in that life. Right. And, and looking back, I think I wanted to prove to my parents that, that I could be normal as well, but I, but I never really was. And, um, but it was also hard to give up that identity. Mm. I had I had a kind of an opening of consciousness when I, I had my company and I was sat at my desk. I remember that moment really well. I was sat at my desk, a uh, wonderful building on the Vondel Park in Amsterdam, and it just opened up and um, and I started to ask awkward questions to, to CEOs of, of the major Dutch companies that we used to work for. Right. Uh, and I had to sell my business. And then I started to write for, for corporations that were more um, uh, reflective, were more thinking about their role in society. But at some point I decided to let go of that too. And I had to let go of that whole identity of being a, uh, a communicator in that world mm. and that was a hard time mm. and and so yeah it was like jumping from one thing to another and I didn't have friends in say the spiritual world yet mm. I, I didn't really know where that was yet um, so now I feel very very comfortable I feel very I feel like hand in glove as as the person in my life beautiful beautiful yeah now you're also involved with i think it's called the center of human excellence in uh, <laughs> it's called Holland. the center for human emergence emergence okay yes. well emergence <laughs> must mean excellence at some point so yeah. um tell us a little bit about that uh yeah that's really been a blessing in my life the center for human emergence is a um, it's based on spiral dynamics right. which is a theory about how life tends to be more and more complex and how people evolve from dealing with you know more um, uh, less diverse realities to more diverse realities and so um, we said uh, let's let's assume we're in the next phase we don't really know what it looks like, but let's assume oneness. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And, and then, if we put that first, then how do we do? How do we govern ourselves? Let's, let's make ourselves into a laboratory in which we are the scientists because we're studying this new paradigm. Oh. But we're also uh, the lab rats but because we're also the ones we're, we're trying it on. And uh, so many of the things that I can put into practice uh, here um, uh, in Fintorin, I've, I've learned there, which is you know, tapping collective wisdom. Even, you know, how do you set up a meeting so that can happen? Um, and, and technologies that are now more mainstream, like open space and World Cafe, they were mm. very, very new mm. 10 years ago, very new ways of, right. of talking, uh, starting a meeting with a check-in. Uh, also, we have, we have governed ourselves uh, with, hol with holacracy, which is a completely new mm. way of, of governing in a, uh, of governance and of, of, of running an organization. Um, Yeah, what else can I say about it? But that it, um, it's really been a, a place of practice for me. I think when we started it, we thought we were going to take the world by storm. Um, that hasn't really happened yet, but it could still happen. Mm. And um, yeah, I just think when I turned 50, um, I thought, what to do? I'm turning 50, what shall I do? And then I said to my partner, I have this strange, this strange thing. I would love to have a men's dinner with me, the only woman at the table. Ah, right. <laughs> and he said to me, well, why not do it? Yes. And it turned out to be a wonderful evening, really a wonderful evening. Did you wear a dinner jacket and a bow tie? <laughs> no, no, I wore a dress. <laughs> uh, but it was lovely to be sat amongst all these men who, who have been... Uh, yeah, friends and companions and influences in my life. Mm. Um, my father actually, uh, who is deceased now, but he paid me a, a real compliment. Uh, he, he got up and, and, uh, and said that uh, when I was small, I used to walk with my hands on my back because he used to walk with his hands on ah, his back. Yeah. And then he said, but that's actually the last time you did things like me because you often do things that I do not understand. But five or ten years later, I read about them in the newspaper. Oh, and that was a yeah. very beautiful thing yeah. he said to me. So yeah. I think with the Center for Human Emergence, um, I even sometimes have difficulty finding words for what we do and how we do there. And at the same time, things we do b become normal you know, in five or ten years' time. Mm. Can I ask, do you have, um, do you have a vision at all for the evolution of humanity um, or the emergence of humanity um, in or outside the sort of context of spirituality or spiritual community? What would be your vision for the future of humanity? Do you see, how do you see us evolving, if at all? What is, what is, what is meant to emerge? What is say? meant to emerge? Well, I love the model of spiral dynamics because it kind of speaks to, you know, we came from, from the one and we um, very, how can I say this in English, sorry. Um, I mean, we, we, we learned to grapple with more and more complexity of life. Mm -hmm. But in the grappling with more and more complexity of life, like, like the, uh, the physicists, physicians, no, physicists, physicists yeah. have, have discovered, you know, we come back to the oneness of life. Yeah. So I think the path of every human being is we come from the unity of love, we come from oneness, but mm. we're not conscious of it. And then we develop an ego, and then at some point we kind of go beyond that and we become conscious beings. And I think as humanity, we're on that same path. But we're right now very much in the egoic movements. Mm. But there will be a moment that more and more of us will see, oh, that's not actually what it is about. Mm. We are not our personalities. It is the light can shine through our personalities. Mm. Mm. But in the end and in the beginning, we're actually one. 
So I do see us evolve to there, but but eternity has time on its hands. Mm. So you know, as human beings, we have these short time spans, and we're we're kind of impatient. Why doesn't it happen now? Yes, yes. But as eternity, I mean, why why hurry? Mm. Uh, so it might be a mm. while. Mm. Now you've written three books, including this one, with a beautiful picture of you there on the front, called A Light. So tell us about your books. Um, You've already mentioned, um, I must get it right this time, the, the, <laughs> the last eldest daughter. daughter. The eldest daughter effect, effect, not the last, the eldest daughter. Yeah, the effect. eldest daughter effect. Yeah. And then we have a light, and you also wrote an earlier one, didn't you? It's called, well, it's in Dutch only. It's called To Find. So this is the only one in English, is that right? So yes, far. for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For now. A few months, wait a few months, and there okay. will be two in English. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the first go. one is, is uh, uh, the five childhood conclusions, and that is basically what I learned. So what are the five childhood conclusions? Ah. The five childhood conclusions is, I don't belong, ah. I must go away because I don't belong. Right. I'm not enough, there isn't enough and I'm not enough. So these are false conclusions in a sense. Yeah, these are conclusions of the little tiny, tiny yeah, baby. Yeah. And things happen, and you kind of take fright, and and you know, the the not enough is very easy. It's kind of um, you're being fed, but you're not completely full yet, and you want to be held, but you're put back in the crib because there are other children, or your mother has to go and do something, or whatever, and you kind of go like, ah, oh, 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 you know, you want more, and and. Because everything is still, you are everything as a child. There is no, you're all subject, there is no object yet. Right. It's kind of, instead of thinking, oh, there isn't enough time right now for me, you think, oh, I, I'm not enough. So, and then that is a pattern that you kind of build your whole worldview on. And, and theory has it that we either have one or both of these conclusions run our lives for, you know, a big part of the time, un mm. until you start to see that it's just a pattern running mm. and you don't need to believe it. Mm. Mm. So what were the other three again? And the other three are like overlays on ah, these yeah. two. Mm -hmm. So the third one is, um, I must not be humiliated, so I must not show my creativity and my originality, uh, mm. because when I do, you know, people will laugh and I will be humiliated. Yeah. Uh, the fourth one is, is I can't really trust anybody and I must remain in control. And the fifth one is, is the I must be perfect. I must be perfect at all times or dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of very sorry conclusions that we come to. And we all children. carry these into our adult life, of course. We carry these yeah. into our adult life until yeah. we become aware of them. And I, you know, when I went to the Barbara Brennan School, I was in my late 40s, 50s. And I was like, why didn't I know this before? And why don't we all know this? So that's why I wrote a book about it and yeah. make it more accessible because there is, of course, already literature on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And tell us a little bit about um, the new book again, which is the coming out. Daughter, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact. Yes, well, eldest daughters, I have for a long time um, seen the patterns in women who are firstborns in their family. And, and often when I, I speak to people, they're like, oh yeah, it's like, oh, these responsible women who think they're responsible for everybody, for all the other children, for their parents, for the cat of the neighbors, you know, we take responsibility <laughs> for everything. Right, and also, right, right. very often we're quite dutiful if you ask us to do something, you can rest assured it will be done, it will be done well. Uh, when we organized our research day, the eldest daughter day, we were a team of five eldest daughters. We met only twice because it wasn't, wasn't necessary to meet more. Everybody was doing their task, doing a bit more and a bit more and getting everything ready in time. So mm -hmm. we're very dependable. We're also quite thoughtful. We don't take life very lightly often. We're very serious, serious women who like to care for everybody. Um, and, and we're kind of, um, we, we take the lead. We can tend to be bossy without knowing it. And, and so in the, in the book we describe you know, how that all very easily comes from, from the moment of dethronement. Mm. That's actually what it's called. Mm. 
we sit on our throne as yeah. only children, and then the moment of dethronement is this happy occasion when you get a brother or a sister, and you kind of now what is my place in the world if I'm not you know if I'm not the center of the universe, then what is my place in the world? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's go back to to Findhorn. Um, I watched, as I think you did too, a couple of nights ago, the film The New Story, which is based on a conference which happened two years ago at Findhorn. Um, and um, a tremendous film with a lot of wisdom there. Um, what would you say, from your perspective, is or ought to be the new story um, at this time? in the world. What is Yes, yeah, so what is in it? one word I think we go from separation to unity. Right. And we go from authority uh, being someone else who knows more or who has more rank or who ha is older to collective wisdom. Mm. And so when you apply that to education or to, or to business or to politics, you get something completely different from where we are now. Mm. Um, and I think this film is capturing that in, in many areas where that is mm. already happening. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Do you see a, a common purpose arising out of this, which is sort of all-embracing. Obviously, the, the idea is that the film be seen worldwide and be embraced worldwide in terms of a lot of the wisdom shared. Is it also a call to coming together at a, let's say, um, not just a community level, but at a, um, at a level of nations and, and all the other connections that we can make and, 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 and where do you see that going? What is the, what is the ultimate result do you think that this might, this might, um, this might bring about? Yeah, you know, what, is, what is always interesting I think in human history is the points where a new thing catalyzed. Right? Yes. And uh, somebody has once said to me this very great phrase, said uh, the airplane was not invented by the, by the uh, railway industry because humanity wanted to go faster. We wanted to go from one destination to another faster. So the trains were moving faster and faster. But then out of left field came two brothers who invented the airplane. Right. So I think on the level of nations, this will not, this will not happen on the level of nations. This ah, will somehow right. come from left field. And I think we are left field. Uh, but what you see often is that um, there's lots of um, initiatives happening here and there and everywhere and everybody is kind of quite isolated whereas being an expression of the same new paradigm you're kind of all isolated having to find out mm. what you're about and then it is, and some are already more collected. Like the Global Eco Village Network is a very strong global worldwide network that is right. also at the UN. Like Fintorin is, is at the UN already. But I don't think I don't think the UN is going to be it because it's too enmeshed in, in current politics. Right. Um, so I see it more like uh, you know a simile that's being used often, and maybe you know it too, is that of the caterpillar and and the butterfly. Go on. Is, is where the caterpillar is moving along, moving along, and then at some point it kind of spins itself in and, and the cells decay. And then there's imaginal cells, cells that carry the image of, of the butterfly, but they are being attacked first by the, by the decaying cells right. of the caterpillar. But more, of the, and more and more of them are coming still. And at some point, decaying butter, the decaying caterpillar cells are kind of lose energy and so then the imaginal cells need to find one another to come into coherence and then you know the butterfly can grow and come out of its cocoon so again i don't know where we are on that trajectory but i think a movie like this uh is is showing a growing mm. level of coherence amongst ourselves mm. and and a dialogue and how all these seemingly separate initiatives are actually 
you know, starting to see each other and work. The imaginal cells are coming together. And the image of the butterfly, we don't know exactly what the butterfly will look like, but, but we do carry the image of, of this, new, this new world. Yeah, that's beautiful, beautiful expressed. Tell me, um, I always ask this question of my guests, um, Lizette, tell me about the passion in what you do, the joy, where does the joy come from in this? I mean, you obviously have assimilated many, many talents over the years and, and, and attributes, and, and now you're in a place where you're, uh, you could say, at the forefront or part of the forefront of the sort of spiritual movement. Where is the joy and the passion that um, you, know, you get from this on a personal level? How would you I express think the, it? The joy is, um, you know, since I am really living my own life, mm. um, the joy is almost all the time. Oh, beautiful. Unless I contract and I, I think I'm a particle, mm. then, then impatience takes over. And mm. so then I have to go back to remembering I'm also a wave of potentiality. But I have huge joy in, I'm a connector. I love to sit and do my email and connect oh. people and um, I'm, I'm a writer so I love the solitude of just being with you know books and theories and thoughts of others and then my own observations and, and put that. I love the play of words, making sentences that really speak oh. and then I love being here in Fintorn and functioning as as a board person and you know when I was young people asked you know what do you want to be and I always thought my first answer well my, my answer was I want to be an interpreter because my mother had gone to interpreter school she hadn't really finished right but I wanted to be an interpreter and then later I thought I ha I am an interpreter but I'm not an interpreter of one language to another. I'm more an interpreter of one world to another or ideas mm. into, into policies or into matter. Mm. So I, I feel I have that and that brings me, it brings me huge joy. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. Is there some personal inspiration that you could share with the people watching? Something that you know you feel could be helpful to people out there? Some sort of message about you know um, around an optimistic and positive future, which is not—it doesn't always seem to be that way, does it? As <laughs> much as we would like it to be. Well, one personal thing is, um, one personal thing that has helped me a lot is the realization that I didn't need to believe everything I think. And that goes from all these inner voices mm. that are often not so kind. Mm. I don't need to believe them. But also, let's not believe everything we read in the papers. Mm. Find ways of something happening outside with these noises anyway mm. find ways you know don't be mindful of what you eat in the sense of what you feed yourself um, I love Facebook because the friends I have on Facebook share uh, positive optimistic things with me I, I was at a dinner party the other day there's this young Dutchman who has left university because he's just you know zoomed along and he's found something he is now crowdfunding for a huge kind of net where the ocean will move through and the plastic bits will be caught wow. and so he's he's really convinced he's going to clean up the ocean wow and yeah another thing is you know what my father said to me things that are outrageous one moment or or abnormal or you know I'm told that in the boardrooms in Holland a check-in just a moment of silence and then speaking from a personal space of where you're actually at is now a normal thing to do well oh, who would have, who would have thought that 20 30 years and I ago, think yeah. we we can do it we can mm. do it as long as mm. we're 
willing to look beyond the apparent differences. Yeah. Beautiful. And look out for the inner voice. And look out for the inner voice. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Lizette, wonderful. Thank you very much for being here. It's been such a pleasure to hear yeah, you too. share your passion and for the wonderful wisdom you've shared with us today. Um, I hope very much that you've enjoyed listening to Lizette and that have, um, you know, taken from her some of the passion which she shows in her unique position here. And um, may you continue to do such a great service to the community and to the world. On that note, thank you very much for, for watching and for listening. Join me next time on Sharing Your Passion. Thanks, Lizette. Thank you.